Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the third day of Arts Week in Kentucky. My name is Chris Cathers. On behalf of the Kentucky Arts Council board and staff, we want to welcome you. Today, we are taking a deep dive into the topic of arts advocacy. We are excited to have Kentuckians for the Arts as a partner to provide today's topic. We have excellent presenters who are national experts and practitioners in the area of advocacy, policy, practice, and research who will be joining us today to share their knowledge with you. Those of you who are with us in Zoom will be invited to use the chat when we near our time for questions and answer session. Additionally, we are live streaming on Facebook and the comments section is being monitored there. So feel free to share your questions and they will be sent over to the presenters. Last, our session this morning is being live captioned on Zoom. So if you prefer to use that feature, you can turn it on at the bottom of your screen. I'm now going to provide a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes the unique and enduring relationships that exist between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Today, we stand on ground occupied by ancient peoples and whose history has been lost, but whose legacy remains. The evidence of these ancient people can be seen all over Kentucky through the mounds and artifacts left behind. Today, over 170 American Indian tribes are represented by their members living and working in the Commonwealth. Let us honor those who were here and those who are here now and build on the legacy of stewardship of the land they left for us unto the seventh generation. Now I'll turn it over to our executive staff advisor, Emily Moses, to kick off today's first presentation. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Kelly Barsdate, who is the Chief Program and Planning Officer for the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, the professional association of the nation's state and jurisdictional arts agencies. Kelly is joining us today to help us take a fresh look at advocacy, especially as it relates to the nonprofit arts sector. Thanks for being with us today, Kelly. We appreciate your time and expertise. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Chris. It is wonderful to uh, be with everybody. I am going to share my screen here so that we can have some visuals to go along with our conversation. Uh, as Emily said, I am Kelly Barsdate with the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, or NASA. We are the membership organization for all of the state arts agencies across the country, from Alaska to Maine to Kentucky and everyone in between. NASA is headquartered in Washington, D.C., but I'm joining you today from Maryland, the ancestral lands of the Piscataway. A bit of my own background and why I advocate for the arts and choose to do arts policy work. Just full disclosure, right up front, I'm not a lobbyist and I'm not here to play one on TV. I do this work because I grew up in a small town in rural Alaska. Here's a photo of high noon on a February day in my hometown. Some people might think that an isolated, frozen frontier town would be a cultural wasteland or an arts vacuum, but nothing, nothing could have been further from the truth. The arts were a thriving force in Fairbanks, bringing people together and helping kids like me who otherwise might have taken a very different path in life. I'm guessing that some of you can relate to growing up in a small town or a rural area and having the arts be your lifeline. They certainly were for me. And a lot of the arts and arts education opportunities I had coming up were made possible by my state arts agency. They made a point to be present and supportive of small communities, school activities, and community-based organizations that really made a difference in for a lot of families in our day-to-day -day life in my hometown. So that's why I advocate to give back some of what I got. And because the bottom line is that the arts matter. The arts set kids on a positive path. Communities that have the arts are more resilient and better off civically and economically. And that is worth advocating for. 
NASA's approach to advocacy is strictly bipartisan. We know that the arts benefit all communities, rural, urban, rich and poor, old and young. Our experience tells us that art supporters can be found among staunch conservatives, committed progressives, and everyone in between, including many people who don't see themselves in any of the traditional parties and who may be turned off by politics in general. NASA's stance is that the arts belong to all of us. They really belong to everyone. State arts agencies serve everyone. So our advocacy should be inclusive too. At the end of the day, arts advocacy isn't about politics. It's about helping people realize and recognize how the arts nourish us, nourish our communities and connect us to the things that we care the most about. So that's why you will find advocates everywhere you look because the arts are something a lot of people feel passionately about both personally and professionally. It's also useful, I think, to think about advocacy as a civic responsibility something that anyone who cares about their community can do to make their community life better. This is particularly true for nonprofits who are mission driven. I, um, I'm sharing a quote from Board Source, and I love this quote because it really um, speaks to the importance of advocacy as a core responsibility of nonprofits to to make sure that our ideas get heard, uh, that all voices are included, and that we're not relegated to living with decisions that are made about us without us. So Board Source has a whole initiative devoted to helping nonprofit boards learn how to advocate. And I think it's really worth checking out. Each one of us has the opportunity and I would argue the obligation to shape public discourse about the arts and to grow the resources that are available for the arts in our home states. And I think that's especially true for Kentucky. Kentucky is ranked number 43 out of the 50 states for per capita arts funding. State appropriations to the Arts Council have been on a steady decline for more than a decade, uh, a greater percentage drop than any other state in the South. Uh, I'm sure you all have felt that, uh, and it's definitely Kentucky's turn for a boost in arts funding, and you as advocates can help to make that happen. Now, I've been using this term advocacy quite a bit, so let's take a moment to break it down and talk a little bit about what advocacy really means and what its component parts are. I'll go over a few concepts. Uh, and I also think, um, as Emily said, she'll open up the chat uh, in a little bit here and I'll be able to take questions about it as we move along. Um, I find it helpful to think about advocacy on a continuum. It's a continuum of actions that we can take at different times for different reasons. And that continuum runs all the way from education to electioneering with several points in between. The first point on that spectrum is education, which is helping people understand the benefits of the arts and the impact of the arts on people and families and communities. Advocacy is just a slightly different kind of education. It's education that adds in the note that the arts are a worthwhile public policy issue. Lobbying is a slightly different creature. It is asking elected officials to support or to oppose a particular bill or appointment or other legislative action. And at the far end of the spectrum is electioneering. And that's about supporting or opposing a political candidate for public office 
or getting involved in shaping campaigns. So here's how that plays out in practical everyday terms. If you are educating somebody about the benefits of the arts uh, and talking, you might talk about how the arts are good for Kentucky's economy or the arts are good for kids and education or how the arts are helpful for health or com bringing communities together. Advocating, again, is essentially the same thing as advocating. It's just with the mention that the State Arts Council is a good investment and an important conduit for those benefits. Lobbying would be asking an elected official to vote yay or nay on a House bill or a Senate bill. And electioneering would be endorsing a candidate because they believe in the arts and have an arts platform. So I imagine that somewhere along the way, um, you may have heard that nonprofits are not allowed to advocate or that you might lose your nonprofit exemption or suffer some other dire consequences if you engage in advocacy. And that's really not true. As long as your activities are nonpartisan, I'm going to underline that word again, nonpartisan. There are no IRS limits on nonprofit advocacy because essentially it's just another form of public education. There are some limits on the amount of lobbying that 501c3 nonprofits can do, but those time and expenditure limits are. Uh, are thresholds that are far and above what most nonprofits will ever hit. There's a bright line though, when it comes to electioneering for 501c3s. You can't endorse or oppose candidates using your organizational staff time, organizational budget, um, your mailing lists or your social media channels, for instance. Um, again, about a particular candidate. Um, that's a bright line with the IRS. So NASA has uh, published a handy dandy guide to nonprofit advocacy that you can download for free from our website. And Emily, I think uh, now's a great time to post that link in the chat so that folks have the opportunity to uh, check it out. So, Let's touch base on a couple of common advocacy myths and misconceptions. Uh, we've already debunked the myth that advocacy is taking a political side or that it's forbidden for nonprofits. But I wanna weigh in on those last two points about whether one voice, your voice can really have an impact. And what I hope you take away from this morning's sessions is that ordinary people can be the most extraordinary advocates. When you engage in advocacy, you humanize the arts as a policy issue and you serve as an ambassador for the arts and a champion for the arts in your community. If elected officials don't hear from constituents about the arts, they can conclude that the arts are unimportant. But every time elected officials do hear from arts constituents, it becomes that much harder to ignore the issue. It becomes that much harder to portray the arts as a special interest, that much harder to cut funding for the arts, which has been happening in Kentucky for too many years. Your voice matters in that mix because everyone's advocacy adds up. When you advocate for the arts, you become living proof that the arts are a shared value. Uh, like I was saying earlier, and like we saw in that Minnesota picture, arts for all and all for arts. When you go to advocate for the arts, the best way to do it is to share your own stories. 
but it's helpful to frame those stories in a way that policymakers can understand. To help you with this, NASA recently conducted some message testing research. The goal of this project was to look at all of the arts advocacy arguments we've been using for lo these many years and to determine which ones worked and which ones didn't. And to look at that across the political spectrum with conservatives as well as with progressives. We all know it's possible for a policymaker to personally really love the arts, but do not commit to state dollars or federal dollars or local dollars for that cause. So we wanted to learn what helps motivate elected officials to take that leap and support public funding for the arts. So we hired a communications firm with special expertise in policy framing and building political will. And we had them do message testing with actual elected officials and get their feedback on which advocacy arguments they found to be the most credible. So Emily, I think you've got uh, another chat uh, a URL that you can pop in to help people um, take a peek at these resources. And as you're doing that, I'll just go over a few key takeaways from this research. The first is to anchor arts advocacy in the idea of strength. Now this can feel a little counterintuitive because we are used in the arts to thinking of our organizations as vulnerable. We're used to feeling that our needs are great, that we're struggling for resources or in need of help. But our research found that the idea of the arts as a community and family strength was a gateway concept, right? It one, it's one that helps policymakers become more receptive to all of the other arguments and all of the other stories that advocates may wish to share. So our advice is to lead with that idea of strength and then layer selected points about the benefits of the arts underneath. Uh, economic prosperity, no surprise, that certainly resonated as another uh, important idea. Key points to cover there included how the arts create jobs, how they benefit other businesses in your community, like restaurants, hotels, retail, talk about those ripple effects, um, and also how they create opportunities for young people. Um, many states have in their rural areas um, something that we shorthand brain, train, brain, brain drain, which is essentially the exodus of young families and young, young workers away from small communities. And the arts can be a wonderful antidote to that. Uh, they can attract businesses, attract families, create a quality of life and a business climate that's really conducive to, to helping those young people and those young families to stick around. The idea of innovation also was front and center in our message testing. Basically, this is the idea that creativity is a muscle and the arts are its gym. Messages around health and healing and community cohesion also tested as very important. So if your organization's doing anything to help veterans recover from their experiences, to support activities for older adults, doing work for people with health problems or um, the op opioid crisis. It's really good to mention those. Likewise, stories about how your organization and the arts are helping with civic cohesion, civic pride, um, or preserving important cultural traditions those are good to include as well. Now, some policymakers really love the arts, but believe that the private sector and philanthropy, not government, is the way to fund it. And those policymakers became much more open to the idea of government funding for the arts if it's tied to geographic access, creating opportunities beyond the more wealthy areas or urban areas 
they also want to see the arts uh, as a robust return on investment. Now to help you with that ROI piece, NASA collaborated with the folks at the Kentucky Arts Council to put some of these key facts and figures in one place for you. Our return on investment fact sheet offers evidence-based data points on how the arts benefit Kentucky. And Emily's got another chat uh, to help you access this material online. It's also on the Kentucky Arts Council uh, resources page for, for this session. I just wanna pull out a few examples of the kinds of Kentucky specific data that you'll find there. So information like the arts ad 4.9 billion, that's billion with a B, $4.9 billion to Kentucky's economy. Uh, the creative industries support 97,000 jobs for Kentucky families. Uh, for every $1 granted by the Kentucky Arts Council, grantees like you in the aggregate secure more than $80 in matching funds. We've also got points about rural prosperity and how the Kentucky Arts Council is investing in rural areas, examples of how you can illuminate health benefits and education benefits as well. So you can see how these points align with some of the key principles I just talked about in our message guide. So there is a little bit of a, me a method to our madness there um, and helping you really make that return on investment case for the arts in a way that will be compelling to policymakers. Um, of course, a lot of people are really concerned right now about the effects of COVID-19 on our field. The toll that the pandemic has taken on the arts is really, really sobering. Um, and I know you all have experienced this firsthand. Uh, a lot of organizations have had to suspend programming. Um, many events have been canceled. Uh, many things have gone online, but not everything can be translated online in a meaningful way. Even some arts groups are at risk of going out of business. And there are some parts of the broader economy that are doing well. You know, certainly anything related to the tech sector is performing quite well right now. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the economy is inclusive of everybody in that success. A lot of small businesses are really struggling and a lot of people have lost their livelihoods um, as part of the pandemic. So a question that you may get as an advocate is why should our city or why should our county or why should our state spend money on the arts of all things in the middle of an economic crisis? And the answer to that valid question is that supporting the arts doesn't just help the arts, it helps the larger community turn the corner after hard times. So there's some other new research that NASA commissioned uh, on this topic. We worked with Indiana University to conduct an empirical analysis of the effects of the arts on larger economic trends following the Great Recession and other periods of economic hardship. And uh, Emily, go ahead and chat folks that link uh, so that they can uh, download this research as well. The analysis shows that the arts diversify state economies in a really meaningful way, which is very helpful if your state relies on just a few industries that have been hit hard by a recession. The research also shows that uh, the arts accelerate economic growth and employment, broader employment following recessions. So when arts employment grows in certain creative subsectors, overall state employment grows as well. So in other words, the arts help the larger economy rebound from economic shocks. And you can see the immediate relevance of this to our uh, COVID-19 context. 
So this research validates statistically what we already know, of course, through our daily experience that the arts are awesome. Uh, but the Indiana University research certainly helps us put a sharper point on that. Um, we also accompanied that empirical study with some case studies that really show how the arts accelerate recovery from recession or economic downturns, or how the arts help to fortify local economies against future economic shocks. So at that URL that Emily shared, you should be able to also link to some of those case study reports as well. Throughout all of this, as we're talking about the economic importance of the arts, it's also true that the importance of the arts right now isn't limited just to dollars and cents. The arts foster civic cohesion. The arts foster better education outcomes. They foster resiliency in the face of trauma, attributes that are even more important in the wake of COVID-19 when we have all been isolated and our lives have been so deeply deeply disrupted. The arts are a lifeline for us at this time. Here in Washington, uh, NASA is using the economic research that I just mentioned as fuel to try and leverage additional relief funding from Congress. We're making the case that arts relief is a turnaround asset and that a strong arts sector will help a lot of people beyond the arts to get back on their feet. There's another $1.9 trillion relief package being debated in Congress right now. And that relief package includes, uh, among other things, $135 million more in arts relief funding through the National Endowment for the Arts. 40% of that $135 million would be routed through state arts agencies and regional arts organizations to ensure that those relief fundings are spread far and wide. Now, the future of that bill in the Senate is very uncertain at this time, but we are hopeful that one way or another, we will be able to secure some more relief and recovery position, provisions to help the arts because we know that the work you do is incredibly valuable. Uh, and NASA is doing our part in Washington, D.C. to leverage funds that can benefit you in Kentucky. So stay tuned for more. Uh, I'm going to yield the floor to Emily to moderate some questions in just a moment. And I'm really eager to hear what you're interested in asking. So uh, please fire away. Um, uh, any question is fair game at this time. As we make that transition, I also want to just leave you with this bottom line. We all need to be advocates for the arts. We all need to be champions for the arts. We owe it to our communities, to our artists, to our missions, and to the people we serve to do our part. Your next presenter from Kentuckians for the Arts, Lori Meadows, is going to show you how to do that. I know from working with Lori, she's got some really wise counsel and some very practical strategies uh, to share on this topic. So you will definitely want to stick around to hear from her. Um, and if you want to learn more from NASA and our resources, there's a lot of great free stuff available on our website. And Emily, you can pop that link in the chat. You can download uh, items that we call the Practical Advocate Series. Um, you can also download uh, examples of how uh, model messages for how to, how to advocate. Uh, we even have a, 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 an item up there now on virtual advocacy, how to advocate um, in a pandemic when it's hard to get personal appointments or in-person engagements with, uh, with legislators. So, um, lots of free goodies there for you. Um, encourage you to not only use them yourself, but to share them with your boards uh, and share them with your networks. So with that, I want to really thank you 
for all that you do to sustain the arts in your community. Um, and thank you for tuning in to talk about advocacy. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. So Emily, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and uh, be able to see you uh, as we talk a little bit uh, about what folks are curious about. Great, thank you, Kelly, that was wonderful. And I see some questions starting to come into the chat. One of the questions uh, that I wanted to ask you because this is something that we hear uh, pr pretty regularly from the beginning of when the pandemic started to have the effect where things began to close through now with that we've been living through it almost a year. Um, people feel awkward about asking for money for the arts. Uh, when there aren't resources for education, public safety, public health, people are hungry, out of work, can't pay for basic needs. Mm -hmm. um, so the, overall, the question is, how, 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 do I, <laughs> how do I get through those things? And is now really the time to be asking people to advocate for the arts? And we hear that a lot. Perfect, perfect. Um, so there's... <clears throat> I don't think there's any doubt that other needs are really pressing at this time. Um, and I don't think we would ever suggest that we want to increase the arts at the expense of any of these other really important forms of assistance. Um, but I do think that this is a moment to communicate what matters to Kentucky communities? What matters at this moment to you? What is your experience? How is your community life enriched by the arts? And how do you need the arts to turn the corner, rebuild economically, rebuild um, kids' experiences in school, which have been hugely disrupted, by the pandemic and also to rebuild that community cohesion because we've been so far apart from one another. I also think that, um, you know, there's the shorthand of arts and, right? It's not or economic development, it's arts and economic development. The arts is really one of those secret sauce ingredients. It makes everything better. Right, you put it on everything and it makes everything better. So if people are really concerned about um, getting people back to work and reigniting the economy, the arts can help with that. If kids are really concerned that a whole year of kids has been left behind in school and isn't engaged in schooling and in education the way they should be, the arts can help with that. If uh, people are concerned that especially older adults right now are terribly isolated and terribly limited and how they can engage with community which has immediate health outcomes for older adults. The arts can help with that. The arts can help with rural development, it can help with community development and it can give solace and joy uh, during this time as well. So uh, I believe that now is actually a really important time to communicate about those virtues and those benefits and that importance. Remember, advocacy isn't always about asking. Advocacy is about educating. And I think this is absolutely a moment where you can communicate that the arts are something that you care deeply about. That's really well said. I would really, I'm gonna, at some point, I'm gonna, go back and type out that entire answer that you just gave. <laughs> and we're gonna share that with people in a really meaningful way because that, that was so eloquently put and I appreciate all of the, the, all of the thought into that one answer. Um, one of the questions from the chat we have is, what are some of the art advocacy steps someone can take if they are not advocating within a nonprofit? Who can they first reach out to? Um, so I think that the most important thing you can do as a first step is to learn yourself. Who are my, if you have a city council, who are my city council members, who are my county council members, 
who are my representatives in the House, who are my representatives in the Senate. Um, Lori, when she presents, maybe she can offer some tips about where to look that information up. But I think that's the very first thing to do is to determine, okay, so who, who are the deciders who are shaping resources for the arts uh, in the public sector in your community? That's number one. Um, number two, I would say is make sure that your immediate network of people understand not just the, the wonderful arts experience that they're having, but the fact that it is a civic benefit, it is an education benefit, it is an economic benefit. So equip your participants with um, what I call signposting, right? So they know they're having a fantastic arts experience through your organization, but make sure they understand that, you know what, public funds help to make this happen. Right? It was partly a Kentucky Arts Council grant um, that made this event take place and helped to bring this experience to you. I think that's an immediate thing that every artist or arts organization can do as they are doing their work. Um, and then I think it is appropriate to start with your state representatives, start with your state senators and introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm your constituent, I live in your district, and just so you know, the arts really matter to me and share a story. And it really can be that simple. And another question from the chat, should Kentucky tackle a big audacious goal that states like Minnesota and cities like Denver and Pittsburgh have accomplished to secure a dedicated revenue stream for the arts? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, First of all, I am, I think I am a fan of audacity, right? <laughs> um, uh, I think that the uh, state investment in the arts in Kentucky is too low and has been too low for too long. Um, right now, the Kentucky Arts Council um, investment is 35 cents per capita. And um, just uh, check in my facts here. Uh, when, when you look at other states, Minnesota is $6.37 per capita, just for example. So um, I think there's a lot of room for growth. Um, and I think that it is possible to chart a path for that where authorizers and legislators understand the value of that and make incremental progress toward that. So absolutely, yes to more public funding for the arts in Kentucky. Now, there are two caveats that go with that. Number one, timing is everything. You gotta create a window of opportunity where lawmakers will be receptive to that. And the way you make lawmakers receptive to that is you educate them first. You establish the relationships first, you till the soil, you make sure that there's fertile ground for that ask to then take root. So it's never like, you know, zero to 50 in 60 seconds, it takes time. And the best time to begin that work is, is right now. So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two is, dedicated funding mechanisms versus general fund mechanisms. I would not, uh, my counsel is to not be distracted by the source of funding, to focus on the value of the funding and what it will accomplish. Uh, because there are many, many ways that states invest in the arts, including the general fund. In fact, more than 80% of state arts agency revenue in the aggregate comes from general fund expenditures, not from special designated sources. So for states that have them, that's really great and that's really successful. But I think the most important thing is to focus on what the return on a larger investment will accomplish um, and to not focus so much on assumption that a different mechanism will yield the results. I think what leads to quantum leaps in arts funding in other states 
is not a magic mechanism. What leads to a quantum leap is persistent, relentless, positive advocacy. That's what turns the corner. That's great. And that's a great point because I know in conversations we do tend to get to the point where we focus on one thing as the solution. This will be the solution. This will be the uh, the magic bullet. And I, I think uh, one of the things that I think is so nice about the all of the information that you have shared, and especially the links uh, that you shared with the research that you all have done of late, um, and just for uh, so everybody knows, I mean, NASA has done research for years and years and years, and there's lots of it on NASA's website, and it's uh, wonderful and fantastic to use for all kinds of different purposes in communicating with stakeholders. Uh, but I think the recent research really drives home that point uh, that you just said, you know, it's not one effort and it's not one person or one organization. It is the collective. Um, right. So, and that's yeah. a, sh- a bit of a shift. There, there is no, there is no silver bullet. There is no magic bean. Right. Um, it's about relationship building over time. Even even Minnesota, right, that um, has a quantum uh, uh, larger investment in the arts. It took them decades to get there, and the way that they got there was by advocate advocacy that was consistent. It was persistent. It was positive. It was also coalition advocacy where different cultural organizations were aligning with other natural resource groups and there was a consensus cross-sector, multi-sector solution there. Um, so that's another thing, that, another, another good point is that sometimes the best arts advocates are not just arts people. Right. Um, if you can get your bankers involved, if you can get your teachers involved, if you can get your pastors involved, if you can get your participants and your parents involved, um, that's golden. And that will really help to make progress uh, toward a a goal of greater arts resources for for any state. Yeah. And um, another thing that if I had known we were going to have the Minnesota conversation, I would have looked up some other statistics because one of the things you'll also see if you look at Minnesota is that they're not, they're not just uh, top top level funding for the arts. There's top level funding for public health. There is top level funding for education. There's funding there for lots of things. Um, and so I think that that really helps drive home the point also that you know they are all connected in a thriving ecosystem uh-huh. and how important the arts are, the role the arts play in that. So that's that's pretty fascinating. Um, so let me ask you another question. Uh, what if somebody, at, we, we're talking a lot about uh, national advocacy and state level advocacy, but as we also know, advocacy at the local level is extremely important uh, and can also really be extra sticky <laughs> uh, be, because of local politics. So what if someone flat out tells me there's not enough money in the county um, or in my state budget to support the arts? And how do we respond to something like that? Because those are things we hear. Sure, of, of course. Um, here's, my, here's my counsel. Don't accept the premise. Don't accept the premise that there is not enough money. Um, in Kentucky, uh, at the, the state budget, the appropriation to the Arts Council amounts to 0.013% of general fund expenditures, 0.013. So remember all the math training we got in school, that is one-tenth of one hundredth of one percent. So increasing the Arts Council budget to the level it was 10 years ago, would have no appreciable impact on the general fund, but would have a gigantic impact on communities, on kids, on rural areas, and on return on investment. You can run that same calculation about county expenditures as well. Um, And you will surely find that in most counties, the investment of the arts is a small 
fractional part of the total budget. So when people tell me that there is no money to support the arts, I, it's my job to respectfully acknowledge that times are hard and then remind them of the extremely small size of the arts investment relative to the benefits that, uh, that it yields. In other words, the arts punch above their weight in terms of the benefits that they deliver to the public. It's not our job as advocates to get into arguments with people or to be confrontational with people, but it is our job to assert that the arts are a responsible investment, are a wise investment, um, and that there's a high magnitude payoff for uh, low magnitude money. Uh, I, I like the respectfully, I wrote that down, respectfully acknowledge times are tough <laughs> because we know that's true. Uh, and in Kentucky, it has been true. Uh, we've mentioned, we've talked about our budget a little bit. It's come up several times. So uh, one point that I think is interesting to point out that I have not dropped in the chat uh, is that since in the last 12 years, um, Kentucky has seen a 59% reduction in our budget in the, the Kentucky Arts Council's budget, 59% reduction, um, which is much more than a lot of other state agencies even. So uh, I always think that that's an interesting fact to share with folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your slide said that every $1 in grants from the Kentucky Arts Council yields $82 in match. Would using a ratio like that signal that the arts are doing just fine without government funding? What what yeah. what they need it if they've got that other eighty two Kelly? <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. So so that's that's totally a fair point. I mean, um, that's how the data adds up for uh, for Kentucky. But if you are more comfortable using your own organization's match, uh, which may be smaller, uh, if you're a smaller organization, then go for it. Um, the 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 number is less important than the than the principle uh, that a small amount of money yields a big bang for the buck. Um, and that state funding for the arts is essentially a public-private partnership, right? So a little bit of public money, a little bit of government money helps to leverage earned income, philanthropic contributions, local commitment. Um, and that idea of the public-private partnership is really compelling to elected officials, um, at least in our in our message testing and in and in my practical experience as well. Um, oh, you mentioned that there was an IRS limit on how much nonprofits can lobby. Can you talk about what is what is that limit? Can you go into that a little bit more? Okay, so I'll give you a short answer and then I'll give you a, a more thorough answer. Short answer is you don't have to worry about hitting that limit if you occasionally weigh in on a bill from time to time. Don't worry about it. Um, the more thorough answer uh, is that the IRS follows a principle that organizations who do not formally file a lobbying election uh, should not devote a substantial part of their budget to lobbying. And although the IRS itself does not define what substantial part means, um, there have been federal court rulings that have found that 5% of time and expenses was not a substantial part, right? So tax experts will often say, um, just as a rule of thumb, anything under 5% of time and expenses is fine. Now, you can also complete a one-page form that's called a lobbying election form. You can send that to the IRS. And in so doing, you certify that you're gonna follow a formula. And that formula limits the amount of time and money you can spend on lobbying on a sliding scale according to your budget size. So uh, organizations with total tax exempt expenditures of under 500,000 can spend up to 20% of their exempt expenditures on, but on lobbying if they fill out that form. And then there's a sliding scale that goes up with a cap of a million bucks. 
Um, so for practical purposes, most nonprofit arts organizations are not gonna come anywhere close to that limit. Um, also wanna just take a pink highlighter here, a virtual pink highlighter and say, we're talking about lobbying here. The IRS imposes no limits on education, no limits on advocacy as public policy issue education, right? So there are some limits on lobbying, but not on education, not on advocacy and not on being an ambassador. Only if you are telling your elected officials to vote yay or nay on a particular bill. Thank you for that distinction. Okay, I think we have time for one last question um, before we wrap up. Uh, and this is another thing that we hear a lot. I really wanna advocate for my organization, but I am an organization that is a staff of one. Just, right. Right. and I'm overwhelmed <laughs> and I can't add one more thing to my list. Um, how can I add advocacy on top of everything else I'm trying to do? Oh, I feel you. Uh, have been there. <laughs> I have definitely experienced those struggles and the capacity constraints are absolutely real. So uh, I've got, uh, I guess I'd have two suggestions for you. Um, the first is to attend the next section, the next uh, uh, session, uh, section of this agenda with Lori Meadows, <laughs> because I think she is going to offer uh, really practical strategies that um, have a big impact and don't take a lot of time in her session that starts uh, at, at 11. So that's suggestion number one. Suggestion number two, get your board involved. A lot of uh, nonprofits don't do this. A lot of nonprofit arts organizations um, have all of the advocacy burden falling just on the staff. That's terribly difficult for small staff organizations, get your board educated, get them involved in advocacy. And not only will that help to augment what the staff can do, it also increases the chorus, the size of the chorus of voices, extolling the importance of the arts, which pays advocate, the advocacy dividends um, across the board. That's great. Thank you so much, Kelly. So we are going to stop there. Uh, would you like to share a final thought with everybody? No, uh, other, other than thank <laughs> you for this opportunity. Um, yeah. uh, I really, I really appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with you and go out, advocate for the arts. You matter and it makes a difference.